0613. I'm joined today by Cheryl. Hi everyone, my name is Cheryl Dedman. I'm Chair of the Board of No FASD Australia and also a parent of a teenager who is living with FASD. Thank you Cheryl. And Chris? Hello, I'm Christine Brooks. I'm also a board member of No FASD. I'm a teacher and a carer of a teenager with alcohol related disorders. Thank you Chris. And Sophie? Hi everyone, I'm Sophie Harrington and I'm the National Partnerships and Education Manager for No FASD. Thanks Robin. Thank you, Sophie. So Cheryl has, has been homeschooling her son for a number of years and Chris has taught children with FASD and both have a great insight into strategies that do and don't work. Now, no FASD Australia acknowledges and pays respects to present future and traditional custodians and elders of this nation and the continuation of cultural, spiritual and education practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So how do you feel now? We've been through the lockdown, having the kids at home, and now we've got into some sort of routine and it looks like it's all going to change again and restrictions are leaving. There is, some states are making it compulsory for the kids to go back to school. Other states are still giving options to stay at home or only go back a couple of days a week. So Chris is going to share some strategies with us for if your child is still learning at home. I just wanted to talk about moving from a, a, a non-focused mood into an engaged state and it's such an important thing for all of us to do when we're about to start working. As adults many of us just start cleaning up our work area or make a cup of tea or check through our emails but children too need to make that transition so that they become engaged in their learning and their minds are ready to start learning and stay focused. For children with FASD this can often be very hard, far more challenging and a routine to become daily part of their beginning to learn stage is very important. As a classroom teacher I've used lots of different strategies and I think for yourself it's best to choose one that's going to work for you and your child and make this just a part of your everyday routine. Exercises that move the whole body and integrate the brain are really easy. They're fun, they're good. I've always used the Brain Gym ones which are available on YouTube and they have music, they're easy to remember. They cross the midline which is a really important asset to helping learning and they can be done for four or five minutes just before you start learning. Other little uh, strategies are words, uh, sorry, word association games, games such as I spy or tennis elbow, where you're just thinking of one word, the next person thinks of a word that would relate to it, like tennis, elbow, shoe, and moving on. So those sorts of little word games, or one of my most popular ones in the classroom, which always gets the children settled and ready to go, is just counting by twos up to a hundred using your hands on your knees and crossing over again, making sure you cross the midline and counting by twos all the way to a hundred. That's that stage from going from a mood of being relaxed to a mood of being engaged and starting to re be ready to focus. Some children find it really hard to sit still and they require heavy work and heavy work might be something like carrying a load of books, filling up the bucket with sand and carrying it around to another classroom things that will require effort and often a child that might be very restless will come back after doing some heavy work, settle down and find themselves much more uh, ready to start. Their sensory inputs been addressed and they're feeling a lot calmer within themselves. Those little strategies help. For children that are sitting on the ground and on the floor or even at a desk and find it really difficult to keep themselves still, fidget toys are wonderful. Now you can buy fidget toys like this little one here, which is just a cube and the older teenagers just love. It's got little things that move, little buttons, clips, switches. Little fidget toys like that can be held quietly in their hands while they're learning and listening and it really does make a difference to their concentration. One of my favourites with the younger children is my little bendy man. He's quiet, he doesn't make any noise. The children can sit there and play with him, fiddle him around, can't hurt him. And he's um, a really great little fidget toy to have available. Something even smaller and lovely tactile, tactile feel, squashy, is one of these little stretchy, little stretchy mans. 
if you don't want to spend a lot of money, blue tack, even elastics around the wrist are a great little fidget toy and can keep a child from getting really easily distracted. One of the things I love and we have used a great deal is this lovely rug, which is made out of a number of different fabrics, ribbons, buttons, zips, and very, very soft feeling. Children will sit with it across their legs, feel it as they're just working away. They'll often, I've seen children just sitting there doing their work and it's across their legs and they just have one hand gradually rubbing across the fabrics and helping them stay calm. These are important for children that suffer sensory issues. They really do make a difference to their learning, get them ready. Make sure when you're ready to learn, your workplace is ready, your mind is ready, and that you really enjoy the learning and have a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chris, for that. And if anyone's got any questions throughout the web webinar, could you just refer them to Sophie? And at the end of this, we will answer any questions that anyone may have for any of us here today. So sensory processing, that is the ability to take in information, filter it, pay attention to the important information, organise it, interpret it and respond appropriately. So a lot of individuals with FASD though don't have this sensory processing. They may be hypersensitive or hyposensitive to light, sound, touch and smell. They may have tactile defensiveness, not wanting to be touched or conversely needing a high tactile stimulation such as cuddling or touching others all the time. So this is where FASD is a spectrum disorder. So there's no two the same with FASD and they can go from one end of the spectrum to the other. So it is very hard and that's what we say. It's what, if you know one person with FASD, you only know one person. This next little YouTube that I'm going to play here is to show for us for any, to what it's like for someone that is, has hypersensitivity and sensory processing issues with light and sound. So if anyone has issues with noise, please be ready to turn the volume down on this though, because it can be quite loud. But this is what it's like for these children or individuals that have uh, sensory processing issues. Hi Robin, I'm not sure if you can hear me. It's Sophie. Just letting you know we're not actually experiencing any sound for this clip at the moment. I think it's Hi. quite quite amazing. Sorry, Robin. Now. May I interrupt you? Can yes, you hear me? certainly. Apologies, everybody. We actually just couldn't hear the sound then for the audio clip. Um, oh, so we can hear each other perfectly well in terms of panelists, but we just didn't have okay. the audio. Okay, sorry, that's yeah. a slight technical issue there. I apologise for that. 
um, and I will actually um, send that send that link out so people can actually see what that's like because I'm afraid without the sound you don't quite get the impression there but it is very difficult for individuals that have sensory issues there and you can see why they actually go into this fight flight or fright response that can quite often happen because they get so overwhelmed by these sensory issues. So some other helping uh, individuals with FASD is the task breakdown. So it's good to actually break down tasks for them. So first of all we do table work and then we do the toys. Then we go to we can put in an extra step. First we do circle time, then we do table work, and then we have play time. Use visuals, they are very, very important, I think. And especially with timing, a lot of the individuals with FASD have no idea about timing. So you may say to them, you need to pack up in 10 minutes. So it might be 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days, They've got no idea really of how long that is. So to be able to see time. So you could use a backward timer like this. Another a good method is the sand glasses there. So you can use the sand timers so they can actually see the time disappearing. Or you could actually make up those paper chains and make 10 paper chains. And after each minute, take one paper chain away so they can see time going down so that they know that, okay, this is time to pack up now or know when they need to get ready to pack up. And it's very good for them to have um, visuals on what's happening for the routine during the day. The supports, and I said, mentioned this the last time, was about just maturity. And I think it is so important just to keep that in mind, to support their child, your child at their developmental age, not where the age, where their age says they should be. Things you need to do is you have to be concrete in your terminology. So it's no good saying to you, oh, saying to them, you can do this, it's a piece of cake, because they'll just be looking for their piece of cake. You need to have consistency and that means a lot of consistency with terminology as well that's used because you might ask your child whether they want to go to the toilet and use that as a term and you may have a carer came, come in at some stage and look after your child and they may say to the child do you want to use the bathroom so they're not going to know what a bathroom is so you must have consistency in what in terms repetition um, I can't repeat that one enough because that is what they need over and over and over again. Sometimes you wonder whether they ever will learn but they do and it's a repetition and along with that the routine which is very very important. So to have a routine so that they can get used to where that is. Terms must be simplistic as well. So keep everything very simple, just only one direction at a time. And be specific when you're asking them to do things. So if you ask them to go tidy up their room, that actually means doing a number of things. So you need to be very specific in that you tell them, first of all, to go and pack all your toys away, then to put your clothes in the dirty basket. And after they've see, done each step, then you tell them to do the next one. Because it is, um, they need to have specific instructions. And that is the structure. This is what they need, is structure all the time to keep their life in place so that they know what's happening. So I'm now going to ask Cheryl if she can share with us some other ways of engaging. Hi, thanks Robin. Um, last week during our webinar, I explained that I've been homeschooling our son who lives with FASD for a number of years. Now during that time, I've had lots of opportunities to learn about the best ways to engage him and how to help him to learn to the best of his ability. So you've just heard some great strategies from Chris for children who find tactile objects and fidget, joys, fidget toys very calming. This can help them to prepare to learn. I'm going to follow on from that and talk about other children with FASD who, instead of calming them, these objects can actually overstimulate them. And this is following on also from Robin, who's just talked about FASD being a spectrum. So, and I'll also talk about the importance of regulation to prepare our children for the best learning situation possible for them. So let's talk about the learning area first. Keep it simple. Minimise distractions. 
So avoid putting um, stimulating things in there that might look pretty or cool because they can actually be very distracting. Think about your child's senses. The more work your child's sensory system is dealing with because of what they see, hear, smell, touch and taste, the less they have left to manage their schoolwork for that day. Just consider the senses that your child would be using at home with things going on such as road noise, people walking by, roadworks, lawn mowing, the family members who are home and what they might be doing. They might be working from home, doing school, cooking, cleaning, watching TV and all those Zoom meetings that happen. Things that may be in their learning area that can be fiddled with, thrown and destroyed can be very distracting such as also such as brightly colored posters, office accessories and books. Many of these things we can't control, but by being innovative and flexible, we can minimize the impact. For example, look at the best place in your house that will reduce road noise and people won't be seen so much walking by. Consider the best time for cooking and cleaning. Cooking can actually be part of the whole learning program. Remove items within the learning area that can be distracting. So why type of noise um, that can be going in the background can also help to focus. Ask family members to set themselves up in an area of your home that is going to reduce distraction to your child as much as possible. Then preparing for learning. Preparing your child's brain and body for learning is like putting good quality fuel in your vehicle. Basically, what you put in will affect how your child will function. I'm a huge fan of proprioceptive exercises. These exercises can calm, focus and alert. Proprioception is how our body knows where it is at any time because of the receptors that are in our muscles and joints. Many children need these receptors to be stimulated, which can happen with pressure, things such as squeezing through a tight space, hugging someone, wrapping up in a blanket and jumping up and down. So children with FASD often seek sensory input to balance their proprioceptive system. If the system isn't in balance, children will be unable to recognize how close a table or chair is. That's frustrating and can cause a lot of agitation. They may not be able to write correctly because they're unable to recognize the level of force needed for writing. Often they will appear hyperactive because they are seeking ways to correct the imbalance in the proprioceptive system, which will help them to calm and focus. There are two documents relating to the proprioceptive system, which will be included in our resource page that you will receive following the webinar. So here are some simple ways to help your child prepare their mind and body for learning. Crawling through a tunnel. If you don't have a tunnel at home, line up some chairs and throw some sheets over the top jumping up and down. Many families have a trampoline, but if you don't, some pillows and cushions all piled together are great to jump into. Most importantly, before going from these exercises into your learning program, do calming exercise such as taking three deep breaths or a yoga exercise. I've found it's probably best not to actually call it yoga. Our resource page, though, will have a link to some easy yoga exercises. And then keeping that regulation going. So as soon as your learning starts, your child's body will be starting to use the fuel that you put in there to prepare for learning. Keep topping it up with mini movement breaks. How regularly you will need to do this will depend on your child. But from my experience, the more the better. Usually we don't go for any more than half an hour without a movement break, which may only be two or three minutes, but makes such a difference to the end of the day outcome. And you may find that you need to actually do much more than that. So some ideas for mini movements, a hopper or bouncer, adult hoppers can also be purchased for older children. A fit ball, also known as a Swiss ball or an exercise ball. Your child can sit on it and move their body on the ball or roll over it. Bouncing a ball. This is a great regulating activity that can be targeted for any age group. An obstacle course at home using things that you've got in your own home is a great activity. And our resource page will have a link to purchase at a small cost mini movement break cards, which you can print out at home. Your child could pull one out of a box, which would avoid the frustration of them wanting to choose all different ones or not knowing what to choose. 
If your child refuses to join in a mini movement break, just do it yourself. I guarantee that you'll at least feel more regulated. This is going to be a very challenging time for your child and your family. I'd suggest preparing yourself for the likelihood of needing to be with your child or nearby ready to assist. I know this will be hard for many parents and carers due to their other commitments, but it will make life easier if you're prepared. To help with this commitment, you could perhaps ask your teacher, your child's teacher, if they could just do half a day, because half a day of learning is better than a bad full day. You could also ask your teacher if they could send out hard copies of work so that the work could be done at a time that's best for your child's learning. All of the information that I've discussed here today can be adapted to suit your child and your circumstances. If an activity seems a bit babyish for your teenager, adapt it so you can present it in a way that has a higher chance of engaging them. As you'll know, thinking about safety with any activity is important. Please also remind yourself when you feel like nothing is working, even when you have adapted, changed and provided the best you can, there will be days that just won't work. You cannot help this. Changing things completely to something like a hands-on activity that is still educational may be your best option for that day. I learned very early in my home learning education career to have a plan A and a plan B. So right now, the road we are traveling has many roadblocks and we are needing to take detours. Your child's education is also experiencing a detour. For you and your child, these, this detour will likely have many bumps and potholes that sometimes take a lot to get over and through. But the scenery will be different and there will be things to see and enjoy that you've never had the chance to before. So hold on tight during the rough parts of your journey, but I encourage you to breathe deep and enjoy the unexpected beauty along the way. Back to you, Robin. Lovely, thank you so much, Cheryl. And now Sophie is going to talk to us about transitioning back into school. Thanks, Robin. Um, it's just great to be part of this webinar. I'm listening to the great advice that's being shared by Robin, by Chris and by Cheryl, and taking all of those thoughts on board as well. You know, we, we've now got different messaging in different states and territories around the state, uh, sorry, around the country. So we are transitioning back to school at different periods. I'm personally based in WA and I think today we've reported 82% um, attendance at school. So we're pretty much firing on all cylinders in WA, but I know that's very different around the country. And this process is daunting. You know, our children have been at home for a period of time. We're talking about children across the age range and across the spectrum with Fans D2. Um, and I guess that's acknowledging those feelings too with our children that, you know what, we know this is tough. Uh, having a plan, don't feel the need to rush. Um, so staggering that start and discussing with the school that, well, we're going to bring Sophie back to school half days. You know, we're going to try five half days and confirming that with your child. And I guess making sure that you're in charge of that process because it would be very easy for the child to choose um, because we've got some smart kids uh, about which days they'd like to go. But yeah, try and half day approach to start with and then maybe transition into a couple of full days as you move back into that school environment. Really working on that connection with your teachers. So reminding the teachers of either the individual education plan or individual learning plan that's in place for your child at school, which they will hopefully have, um, and how their strengths that you've seen come out even further whilst you've been at home with them and doing that learning. How you can really build those strengths into their learning week and what that looks like. Um, we will be talking about in our third webinar, which is in a month's time from now, we'll touch on that in a second. We'll be talking more about home education and actually tutoring your child from home and what that looks like. But in this phase, you may have started to notice and already know some of the real strengths your children have had. Um, and we know that children with FASD have many, many strengths. And really be able to pull on those and work on those. So thinking about project-based learning, let's say that um, I'm particularly excellent at photography and it grips me and I love that. Being able to embed that within the curriculum is something that's very achievable uh, in terms of creativity and artistry and looking at the literacy that can go with that, looking at the maths and the science. And we'll certainly explore those different areas a lot more in our next session. Um, 
thinking about, you know, again, the strengths, the athleticism, how helpful and generous some of our young people can be at times. And something that we can frame differently, being determined, sometimes we see that as a real challenge. But when we look at that from a positive point of view, determination and hard working and persistence can really get us such a long way. Uh, and just, I can't stress enough, I guess, that the engagement with the teachers, being able to have that relationship and being able to move forward with our, our young people to uh, be in a place to, to really work to their strengths when they go back to school. Okay, Robin, thank you. Lovely, thank you so much, Sophie. That was lovely advice for us. And as we've got no sound, we'll skip over that one. And um, we'd just like to, as Sophie was saying there, we're transitioning back into school in the, and so our third webinar, we've decided to put off for a month. Just to give a bit of an idea, to give you all a little bit of an idea of how things are going. And if it's not going so well, you might like to have a look at some different options for your child's learning. But you also might like to join us just to find out some of these different ways of learning that you can incorporate just when your child's at home with you as well. So these practical um, strategies I don't think would ever go amiss whether you're teaching, whether you're helping your child to learn at home, homeschooling or whether they are going to school all the time. These will help for you to help them. So Sophie do we have any questions and questions at all? We do, yes, we've got three questions, Robin. So I'll skip through the first couple quite quickly. I'll be able to give these answers. So somebody's asked, when will the recording and links be available? I can't wait to share this uh, week's webinar with my friends. Thank you for the person that said that. Um, and the recording and the webinar, sorry, the webinar recording and the links to all the resources we've discussed today, we were hoping to get those sent out to you tomorrow afternoon. So that'll be sent to you. Um, I've got a question for Chris. Um, Chris, where did you get your bendy man and what should we Google if we're looking for it? Um, I, 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 <laughs> I prize my little bendy man. I actually bought this at a, um, a fabric shop somewhere. I just saw it on one of those little table throwaway tables. But I know you can get them through the um, special supply places. Um, oh, Cheryl, what's the name of it? The, um, for sensory, sorry, sensory tools is a place. Yes. There are a number of websites that do sell sensory toys or fidget toys, um, but I've seen it at several places. So you can get these little fellows, but they're unbreakable. I can't tell you how old this is. <laughs> Honestly, he's been chewed and bent, and it, the, the thing I like about it, it's nice and quiet. Nice and quiet. Yes. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Chris. And we will send out some links in the uh, with the resources we send out tomorrow. Um, and my final question at the moment is for Cheryl. So one of our participants has asked um, Cheryl that last week you discussed how hard it was leaving the school community and feeling left out. The participant was wondering, did you consider special school before home learning? Uh, why, why not? And do you recommend special school environments to help the students to learn at their own capacity? That's a really great question. Um, when we made the decision to leave the main school um, system, mainstream schooling system, it was really hard. And we looked at all options. We looked at different schools. We actually withdrew our child for a term so that we could get ourselves together and think of what other options there would be. Locally, our special school will only accept children with an IQ of 70 or under. So that hook our child out of that equation because he has very high IQ. There, it was very clear early on that there weren't going to be any schools that would be able to cater for his needs. And he's, um, I mean, he has a very short attention span and it has become better as time has gone on, but that has been through a lot of strategies and gradually building him up. I am confident that there was not a school locally that would have been able to support him to build up um in that way does that answer that question sophie sorry cheryl i muted myself i think that answers that question absolutely and uh, the person that sent that question through if you do decide that you would like some more information on that please feel free to email one of us or call the helpline um, and we will certainly be happy to give any more information around that for you lovely thanks cheryl thank you Thank you, Sophie. 
Um, so thank you all very much for joining us here today. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you all. And please um, join us for our next one, which will be held on Tuesday, the 9th of June at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.